Our subject is starvation in D.C. I want to read you some things the Bible says about itself. In 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, the Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. That means it's good for you. All scripture is profitable. Amen. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. All scripture is good for that. The Bible declares further about itself in 2 Peter 1 and verse 21. The Bible says this, listen. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. We ought to be careful how we read the Bible and how we regard it. And how we seek to bend it and twist it to support our pre-opinionated ideas. It's all God's word. Under the direction of the Holy Ghost it was given. In John chapter 17 our Lord was praying what we really call the Lord's Prayer. And in verse 17 he said, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Would you say amen, beloved? Now, in spite of these texts and others like them, there is an incessant attack on the Word of God. People don't like God's Word. Now, in the first place, they don't read it. The Bible has not failed them. They have not studied it. They attack it, they attack it, they condemn it because it condemns them. It condemns the lives they live and the things they want to do. But I've told you before out here what Daniel said in Psalms 119 and verse 89. He says, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. The word of God is settled in heaven. It cannot be altered. It cannot be obliterated. It cannot be disallowed. It cannot be thrown aside. It cannot be expunged from the universe. God's word is settled in heaven, and it is the will of God that his word should stand forever. Matthew 24 and verse 35, the Bible says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. I told you one night about the trip we had to the caves at Qumran, that place where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. And I tell you, it's an interesting thing to realize that these scrolls in those old clay jars had resided in those dark and sealed caves for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, of years. And when men found them because they were old, they got very excited about it. But it's the same word we've had in our homes and in our hands all the time. They got all excited about that. People will travel for hundreds of thousands of miles just to get a glimpse of the scrolls from the Dead Sea Caves. But ladies and gentlemen, those scrolls don't tell you anything that you don't have in that Bible that's in your home. People just don't really love the Word of the Lord. I heard a story once of a little girl who was helping her mother dust. She picked up her Bible and it was covered and caked and she was wiping it off. And she said, Mother, whose book is this? And the mother, in a moment of nobility, said, Daughter, that's God's book. She said, then why don't we give it back to him? Nobody here reads it. And it's about like that. There are people who keep Bibles just because they want something lying on the coffee table. There are folks who keep Bibles because they went out and bought an expensive one and they want other folks to see it. There are folks who keep Bibles because they got the family record written in there somewhere. They got all kinds of reasons for having Bibles, but how little that book is studied in the homes of the people. And it's these very people who form opinions. It's these very people who don't like it. It's these very people who think that at a whim they can get rid of it. But Jesus has said to them and to us, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. When they 
found the Dead Sea Scrolls, the most complete scroll was of the book of Isaiah. It's on a leather strip 40 feet long and 11 inches high. And I read how painstakingly they unfolded that leather. They were spraying it and they were soaking it and they had it in a room full of humidity so that it wouldn't crack and break up, you know, and they were rolling it out. And when they finally got it all rolled out, the thing that was interesting to me is this, that right smack dab in the middle of that 40 foot long scroll were these words from Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 8, the grass withereth and the flower fadeth. But the word of our God shall stand forever. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe what the Bible says, don't you? The word of God tonight stands. There are people who sat through these meetings and they enjoyed hearing me. They enjoyed hearing Walter. They enjoyed hearing the question man. They enjoyed the music and they enjoyed all the other people taking part. But they would not do God's will. Well, I want you to know that if you ever make up your mind to obey God, you go run into the same truth you heard before. It's not going to change. There are not going to be any adjustments. God's not going to compromise. He's not going to do something to make you comfortable with the word. When you make up your mind you want to go to heaven, you got to meet that same truth you've been hearing out here for four weeks. Would you say amen out here? For the grass withereth and the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. It's not subject to a human vote. It's not subject to popular opinion. Intolerance built the fire and tried to burn up the word of God. Tradition dug a grave and tried to bury the word of God. Infidels made light of it and tried to humiliate the word of God. But today, the Bible is the world's bestseller. And tonight, it's the only guide that can take man off this miserable planet into the heaven of heavens. Would you say amen out there? Forever, O oh Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Now, God challenges all the smart alecks and all the people who would tamper with his word. God says in Isaiah 44 and verse 7, produce your call, saith the Lord. Come up with something. If you can explain the future, let's hear you do it. God said, I've put my name on the line. I've put my reputation on the line. I have told you what will come to pass hundreds, yea, even thousands of years before it ever happens. And when God speaks, it takes place mathematically correct. God says, now if you can do that, come on, produce your cause. Let us see what you can do. But people don't want to do God's will, and yet they can't do anything about it. They can't change it. This word that people make fun of has transformed men. This word that people make fun of has turned cannibals into Sabbath school teachers. This word that men make fun of has turned profligates and whoremongers into gospel preachers. This word that men make fun of has transformed the world. I want to tell you something. If suddenly you could withdraw the word of God and the knowledge of it from the earth, this whole world would turn into a jungle just like that. In fact, it's turned into a jungle awfully fast because men will not listen to the word of God. You see, crooked folk don't like the word because it's straight. Liars don't like the word because it's the truth. Adulterers don't like the word because it is clean. The theater crowd don't like the word because it is pure. And sinners don't like the word because it is holy. Would you say amen out there? There's no problem with the word. It's with us. And yet the Bible says that mercy and truth emanates from God. I read to you out here one night, all God's commandments are called truth. And along with truth comes mercy. There are people who want to fight, you know. They want to make the Old Testament fight the new, as I told you this morning. They want to make Jesus fight God the Father, as I told you this morning. But ladies and gentlemen, there's no such issue between God and those things which belong to him. The Bible says in John 1:17, grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Would you say amen out there? Jesus not only brought grace, but as someone prayed tonight, he is the truth and all his commandments are truth. He said, don't you think that I've come to destroy the law of the prophets? I came not to destroy, but to fulfill. Why, if I did away with my commandments, I would be doing away with myself because all my commandments are truth and I am the way, the truth and the light. How can I go against myself? It was Christ who said a house divided against itself cannot stand. What do you think Christ is? And what are we accusing him of? Grace and truth. Mercy and truth. 
law and works came by the Lord Jesus Christ. Psalms 25 and verse 10, David says, all the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth. Some people only want mercy. They don't want the truth. But you got to have the truth in order to have mercy. Frank Sinatra used to sing a song, you can't have one without the other. You can't have grace until you're willing to do God's will. Anybody who wants grace without being willing to obey is presumptuous. And presumptuous sin is the most dangerous sin a man can commit. Would you say amen, beloved? Grace and truth are the paths of the Lord. In Proverbs 3 and verse 3, the wise man said, Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. But many false prophets are going out into the world and the devil's masterpiece, the devil's greatest craft is deception. He is called the deceiver. This is how God recognizes him. There are people for whom the word of God can never be made clear. No matter how you read it or let them read it. How many times have I turned my Bible upside down and say, now you follow me while I quote it. And they will look at it and say, yeah, but. I told you out here the difference between a sheep and a goat. A sheep is submissive. And a sheep will go to slaughter even without a struggle. But a goat is always button. You know, I understand it, but. I want to do God's will, but. In fact, I, I believe all the truth, but. That's a good candidate for goathood. Jesus said, my sheep know my voice and follow me. There are people, however, who persist in evil so long, they get to the place they can't see the truth. That's dangerous. And it might not be the preacher's fault. Would you say amen out there? Some folks say, I can't see it. And I wonder if they're bragging or complaining. I can't see it. I was preaching at a university once, a college rather, and, and I was talking to these students twice a day. And all through the day, I was counseling in an office. And a young lady came in that office to see me and her eyes were blazing. She had her blonde hair piled up on her head. And when she sat down, her dress was so immodest, I had to look up in the air like this. And then she started rehearsing what I had preached. And she said, I can't see that. I don't see anything wrong with smoking marijuana. I don't see anything wrong with taking a social drink as long as you don't get drunk. I don't see anything wrong with rock and roll. While she was saying what she didn't see, I turned into my Bible to 2 Corinthians 4, uh, verses 3 and 4. I turned that Bible upside down to her and I put my finger on it. I said, you know, I know what your problem is. Let's read about it in the Bible. It says, if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the eyes of them which believe not, lest the glorious light of the gospel of truth should shine unto them. I said, that's your problem, lady. I'm not your problem. You had this problem before I got here. Before you ever had a sermon I preached, you had this problem. Your problem is you are lost. I can look at you and tell you are lost. So now that we've identified your problem, why don't we deal with that? You know, in a little while, the both of us were on our knees praying together, and there were tears streaming down her face. Every time we get angry at the Scriptures, let us remember there's nothing wrong with the Word. The problem is with us. Every time we're confused about the scripture, it's not because the Bible is unclear. It's because we don't want to do right. And we are looking for loopholes instead of light. Would you say amen out there? Can't see, they say. And then there are some who say, well, I would do it, but my parents uh, did another thing. And I figure they were good saints, so I can be saved doing what they did. Well, let me tell you in the book of Acts chapter 17 and verse 30, God says at the times of ignorance, he winked at him. Now, I told you one night out here, the Bible says when Jesus comes back to this earth, there will be silence in heaven for the space of a half hour. Now, in Ezekiel 4, 6 and Numbers 14, 34, the Bible says in reckoning time prophecy, a day for a year. So when Daniel spoke of the 2300 days, he was talking about literally three, 2300 years that began in 457 BC and extended until 1844 AD, a day for a year in reckoning time prophecy. Now, if the Lord Jesus is going to leave heaven and he said he's going to bring all the angels with him and he's coming in the glory of the father, there's not going to be anybody up there. And so there will be silence in heaven for a half hour. Well, if a day is a year, how much is a half hour? Uh, if you get your mind to computing, you'll discover that a half hour on that basis is about seven days. 
or one full week. Now when we consider that Christ is coming to this earth and the round trip will take at least a week, a glorious truth begins to break on our minds. I got a granddaddy who never heard about God's Sabbath. I've got a granddaddy I never laid eyes on. His name was Reverend George Reeves. But from all I've ever heard, he was a saint of God. And if he was the daddy of my mother, he must have been something. George Reeves was a good man. He was a charitable man. He was a clean man. But he never heard of the Sabbath. And he died without hearing it. Many people who did the best they could died without hearing it. And they're going to be in the kingdom of God. But the Bible says, blessed are they that do his commandments. That they may have a right to the tree of life. And may enter th in through the gates into the city. The Bible lays out as a specification, indeed as a requisite for going into the city of God, that you got to keep the commandments. Now my granddaddy kept nine. He didn't know about the other one. There are many saints that kept nine. They didn't know about the other one. So somehow in his wisdom and providence, God could come down here and go back in an instant. But instead, he's going to take a week. And when he comes down here, the trumpet is going to sound. And with all the saints living and dead, old Reverend George Reeves is going to be caught up in the air. And he's going to be so glad to see Jesus. This is my judgment, you see. He's going to be so glad to see Jesus because he lived up to all the light that he had. But when he gets up there, Jesus is going to say, George, you were a good man. You did the best you could. But you know, I'm saving you by grace. You don't really deserve to be saved, George. I'm saving you because when men don't know, I wink at it. But George, there was one of my commandments that you broke every week. And because he had a heart of gold, I can imagine him falling down and saying, Lord, I didn't know I did that. I know you didn't know. For if you had known, you wouldn't be here. You are here because you didn't know. And I winked at your ignorance. But George, a man has no right to enter in through the gates into the city unless he keeps all the commandments of God. So rather than rushing on back to glory, we're going to take a leisurely trip by Mars and through Orion. We're going to look at a part of this great universe that I have created. And somewhere out in space, we're going to keep the Sabbath holy. Before you march through the gate into the city, you got to keep the Sabbath, George. Yet George's children and George's grandchildren to whom the light has come will be lost as verily as a drunkard and a liar if they try to do what he did. He didn't know any better, but the truth has come to us. Would you say amen out there? Then you got some who say, I believe a man can be saved by his own belief. In 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 13, God makes it clear that a man can't be saved by his own belief. I'm going to turn over there and read that in your hearing. 2 Thessalonians 2.13 But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Would you say amen out there? you got to believe the right thing. They tell me when a man is drowning, he'll grab anything. They tell me he'll grab a brick if you throw it to him. And he'll cling to that brick. Now, he might be ever so sincere in his grasp. But if he's only got a brick, he's going to die. Would you say amen out there? Not enough to be sincere. you got to be sincere about the wrong, or right thing. In the 12th verse or the 11th verse, God says, when a man will not believe the truth, he will send him strong delusion that he should believe a lie. Now, what about a man believing a lie who says he can be saved by his own belief? The Bible says in James 2.19, thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe. Would you say amen out there? If all you got is a belief, you got nothing on the devil himself. The devil of all people believes in Jesus. You know why he believes in Jesus? Because he fought him in heaven and he lost. He tried to kill him as a baby and he lost. He met him in the wilderness of temptation and he lost. He met him at Mount Calvary, thought he won. But early Sunday morning, Jesus defeated the devil's best weapon when he walked out of death and walked out of the grave. Christ had taken the best the devil could throw at him, and he won. The devil doesn't want any part of Jesus. 
That's why if you walk with Jesus, the devil won't want any part of you. You see there, I heard somebody say one time, Jesus says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. He said, let Jesus come in, let him live inside your heart. Then when the devil knocks, instead of you going to the door, you can send Jesus. And when the devil is standing there knocking and Jesus opens the door, he'll say, pardon me, I must have the wrong address. You see, he doesn't want any part of Jesus. He's had enough of him and he believes about Jesus. And if all you do is believe, you got nothing on the devil. Yea, the Bible says, faith without works is what? Dead. dead. Belief without corresponding action is dead. Then you got another crowd that say, well, you know, I always thought that Sunday was the Lord's day. It was called that first by Ignatius in the second century A.D. Jesus said in Mark 2, 28, the Sabbath is the Sabbath of the Lord. The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Would you say amen out there? Then you got some who say, well, I know it's the truth, but I think it's wrong to change. Wrong to change. Jesus changed. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John changed. Peter had to change. And later on, Paul had to change. Lord knocked him down on the road to Damascus. And when he came to, God had somebody come and instruct him and give him the truth. God had somebody come and preach the word to him. And when he had preached the word, Saul changed. He changed so much, they changed his name. I want you to know God can still change your name. If you're a liar, he can change your name. If you're a flirt, he can change your name. If you're an adulterer, he can change your name. If folks call you dope addict, he can change your name. He can still change you from Saul to Paul. What do you say out there? Then they say, well, there are not many doing it. How can so many people do wrong? Well, if you've got intelligence, I'd like to appeal to it. The majority has never been right. When God destroyed the flood with the flood, the earth, how many folks were saved? That's not the majority. That's a little minority. When Sodom and Gomorrah burned, only three were saved. That's not the majority. Jesus came down and he preached. And I got a hunch, never a man spake as that man. I don't believe there was ever before or since a preacher who could preach like Jesus. And yet when he finished all of his preaching and died, rose up from the dead and went back to heaven, he only had 120. We baptized 169 today. The majority have never been right. And a man who follows the crowd is going to hell. For the Bible says in Matthew 7, 13 and 14, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many they be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leads unto life, and few there be that find it. Then there are some who believe that no matter what I do, God hears my prayers anyway. If you say that, you're calling God a lie. For in Proverbs 28, 9, the Bible says, If you regard iniquity in your heart, nor that in the text I want. The one I want says that if you turn away your ear from hearing the law, even your prayer is an abomination. Would you say amen out there? Then there are some who say, well, I, I'm a pretty good fella. I'm doing the best I can. James 2.10 says, if you keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, you're guilty of all. Then there are others who say, I want to do right, but I can't see my way clear. I ask you, what can you see in the first place? I found out scientifically, a man can't even see the present. You see, you got eyeballs up here in the front of your head. And you got pupils and you got irises and you got lenses and all that. And when something happens, your eye must pick it up. And before you know what you saw, it's got to be transmitted along the optic nerves to the occipital pole of the brain, which is in the back of your head. It's the back of your head that tells you what you saw. So when your eyes pick up me, do that. Before you realize what I did, it had to travel from here to here. And by the time it gets back there, you don't even see the present. You see the immediate past. And yet, here we are talking about, well, I can't see my way clear. The just shall live by faith. The Bible says we walk by faith and not by sight. Would you say amen? 
If you hold God's hand in the darkness, it's safer than walking along a lighted way in sin. Can't see your way clear. You can't see anything. The just shall live by faith. Now the Bible said the time would come that men wouldn't endure sound doctrine. And then the Bible said in Genesis 6, 3, my spirit shall not always strive with man. And then the Bible says in Revelation 22, 11, that the day is coming. And when that day comes, the Bible says that he that is unjust will remain unjust. He that is filthy is going to stay filthy. Would you say amen out there? Now this is what the Bible says, beloved. I'm simply quoting the word of the Lord. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He which is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. What in the world has happened? Probation has closed. No more prayers. No more sinners being saved. Jesus is going to throw down the mediatorial censor. He's going to walk out from between God and man. And John the Revelator said, when Jesus moves out of his place, the temple of God in heaven is filled with smoke and no man can enter till the seven last plagues are poured out. But you say, Pastor, what do you mean no man can enter? What man can enter heaven anyhow? You can enter heaven by faith. Jesus said, if you sin, you've got an advocate with the Father. You can come boldly to the throne of grace and find mercy to help in the time of need. In other words, right now, I can drop down on my knees and by faith and through the Holy Ghost and by grace, I can walk right into the throne room of heaven. My case is considered as though I was standing right there and God will have mercy on me as though I were pleading to him in his presence. But one day all that's going to end. He'll be through answering prayer. He'll be through listening to sinners make excuses. He'll be through pleading with hard-hearted people who somehow think it's smart to sit through a whole campaign and still not do God's will. He'll be through fooling with people whose lives are presumptuous and hypocritical. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. He's going to walk out from between God and man. He's going to pull off the garments of a high priest. He's going to put on the regal robe of king of kings and lord of lords. He's going to give the signal to his angels. The trumpets will be brought out. The angels will mount the chariot. Christ is going to step on that chariot. The Holy Father is going to join him. All the holy angels are coming with him. He's going to ride down through space to gather his people home. It'll be too late to pray. Now let me read you something. I'm reading from the book of Amos, chapter 8 and the 11th verse. And I want to read this slowly. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land. Are you listening to me? Amos 8, 11. And it says, the Lord God said this. Behold, the days come, that I will send a famine in the land. Not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. Would you say amen? They shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north even to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. People are going to get hungry. A famine means starvation. One day, when the signal is given in heaven... God's going to reveal to his servants down here, don't bother wasting your money on the Warner Theater any longer. Don't go renting any halls. Preacher, you can shut up your Bible. No need to preach and plead with these hard-hearted folks any longer. It's too late. I'm out of the business of saving souls. They have tried my patience. They have gone too far. The doors of mercy have swung shut on the hinges of grace. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. Preacher, don't stand up there wearing yourself out. Forget it. Go on out in the country somewhere with your family and sit down and meditate on the word. For behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me to give every man according as his works have been. And when that decree goes forth, God says a famine is going to strike the land. That famine is going to hit Washington, D.C. 
There's going to be starvation in the streets of our city. Not a starvation for bread, nor thirsting for water, but a starvation for hearing the word of the Lord. And the Bible says they're going to travel from sea to sea and from north to south seeking the word of the Lord, but shall find none. Somebody who sits through these meetings two years in a row is going to be wondering, where is Pastor Brooks? Where can I find Elder Willis? You know, Lord, I, I held out on you, but now that I see these things happening, I'm so scared. I'm ready to listen. Where can I find Pastor Richardson? Where will I find Chuck Sandifer? Lord, Tell me, I'm ready now, but probation is closed. They're going to start driving around. Have you seen Brooks? They're going to drive over into Maryland. They tell me he used to live over here. Have you seen Brooks? They're going to come down here to the Warner Theater. They're going to look all around in the trash, trying to see if they can find the text that we lost out here. They're going to go around looking for the saints who were baptized. Can you tell us something? What's wrong with you? All of a sudden, we developed a hunger. We are hungering for the word of the Lord, but we can't find it. Why can't you find it? God has withdrawn mercy. Starvation. Going to long for the truth. Oh, as well as I stand before you, somebody is going to long for the truth. And then in the midst of all this, they still won't know what's happening to them. They are unjust forever. Can't be saved. Prayers can't be answered. Get on their knees and weep and cry and moan, but God won't hear. What's happening, heaven? Heaven is closed. No more saving sinners. At that time, they'll be getting a space shuttle ready, probably. At that time, there'll be big sales at the malls, at Woody's and Hex. At that time, there's going to be a gasoline crisis. At that time, there's going to be a great gay rights march. At that time, the bullets might be playing at the Capitol Center. At that time, the Redskins might be out here at JFK uh, Stadium. At that time, folk will be trading their cars, trying to get one that is more economical on gas. At that time, they'll be watching television and will not even know that the decree has gone forth too late. Too late. It is finished. Starvation. Hunger. At that time, longing, but too late. Bring the screen down. At that time, probation is closed. At that time, you've shut your last time through God's appeal. You've had your last evangelistic campaign. At the time, when the yearning of the heart is felt, when the obsession is to hear God's voice, nothing, the heavens turn to brass. God locks up the doors of grace. Too late. Too late. Too late. Too late. Too late. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. Too late. Sit through these meetings as though you're doing me a favor. Too late. Listen to God's truth and act like you're doing something for somebody else. Just being nice to come. Too late. Told you you didn't decide to come out here. You were brought by God so that he could warn you. And for some, it's the last warning. Too late. He that is filthy. Let him stay filthy. You loved your X-rated movies and your magazines. You loved your disco and your rock and roll parties. Filthy! Stay that way! Want to go to hell? Help yourself! Too late! 
too late. And then the Bible says the plagues begin to fall. That first angel pours out his plague, and men are affected with a noise and grievous saw. And on the heels of that, well, let me go through this since I got it up here. This shall be the plague wherewith the Lord shall smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet. And their eyes shall consume away in their holes. And their tongue shall consume away in their mouth. Flesh rottening on the bone. A noisome and grievous sore. The commentaries say that word grievous means it's not only painful and feverish, but it stinks and it runs and it's sticky. And in the midst of that, the second angel poured out his vial upon the seas, and they become blood. And all the streams become blood, the third angel. Fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and it scorches men with fire. Not only the sores, but in their fevered condition, they open up the faucet for a glass of water, and blood pours out. Oh, you say, Pastor, that's incredible. Is it? What happened in Egypt land? When the plagues fell upon the Egyptians, didn't the Nile River turn to blood? Weren't they broken out with blains, both man and beast? And then that angel pours out his vial on the sun and mixed with the sores of blisters. For the Bible says it'll scorch men with fire and they will begin to cry and to moan and to curse God and to blaspheme his name because of the terribleness of the plagues, fire, burning men, scorching men with atomic heat. And then that next angel poured out his vial on the seat of the beast, on that very area where lies emanated to pervert the whole Christian world. And after that, we come to the sixth plague, the war of Armageddon. Too late, too late, nation against nation, driven mad by the plagues, no control over themselves, don't make sense, irrational, illogical, insane. They drag out their weapons to fight. And in their anger, they turn against God's people. Because my Bible says in Psalms 91 that if I'm faithful, no evil shall befall me, neither shall any plague come nigh my dwelling. Would you say amen? And when they realize they're suffering and God's commandment keeping people or not, they're going to turn against them with all of their weapons. Going to turn against them to annihilate them from the face of the earth. This is Armageddon. This is the world's last war. And God's people don't know how to fight wars. So the Lord says, I'm going to come and I'm going to fight that war for you. I'm going to roar from on high. I'm going to rise to shake terribly the earth. And in that last war, figuratively, the prophet says blood shall flow up to the horse's bridles. I don't conceive of a river of blood that deep. What I do conceive of is people being destroyed in numbers such as never before in the history of the world. 75,000 died in Hiroshima at the close of World War II. In less than a minute, 75,000 men, women, and children were turned to toast. That is nothing to be compared to what's going to happen in the world's last war when the Lord rises to shake terribly the earth. Is he going to use an atomic bomb? The Bible says, there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven. Every stone, the weight of a talent, that's about 57 pounds. You're looking at a 50-pound block of ice. If you add seven pounds, that's about the weight of each of those hailstones, and it's going to come driving all the way from heaven. For the Bible says in Job 38, God has the hail already stored up in his armory. Would you say amen out there? And when those hailstones come thundering down, nothing will be able to stand except those who've made a covenant with the Lord by sacrifice. Those stones will hit the buildings that we have built and drive straight through them all the way to the basement. God's going to throw down the kingdoms of this world. And the Bible says it will be as if a man fled from a lion and a bear met him. 
or he went into the house and leaned on the wall and a serpent bit him. That day of the Lord will be darkness and not light, even very dark and no brightness in it. And there'll be nowhere to hide. Like you're running from a bear, you run into a place thinking you're hiding and there's a lion in there. You run out of there into your own house, lean up against the wall to catch your breath and a poisonous snake bites you. Nowhere! Too late! Too late! But the end is not yet. Let me leave that and appeal to you again. God says Babylon is fallen. What do you love so much about a fallen religion? Once you know it's contrary to the will of God, why is it so precious to you? What kind of hold does it have on you? Babylon is fallen. And then God says, come out of her, my people, that you receive not of her plagues. Beloved, I don't want these plagues, do you? Come out, and you won't get them. Join yourself to God's people. If you do that, a thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. Oh, beloved, it's coming. Prophecy has always come true, and the last five or six percent will come to pass. You don't have to worry about it. It's coming. It's coming. Starvation for the truth is going to hit the street where you live. It's going to hit the house where you live. It's going to come into your very heart if you have not embraced God's truth already. It's not Brooks who says, I stand at the door and knock. It's Jesus. Jesus. I don't want anybody following me. Follow Jesus. Jesus. A famous painting of Christ knocking at the door hangs in a national museum. There's a story that one day a loving father who was not a Christian took his little girl out for exercise and he carried her to the art museum. And they were going from picture to picture, looking at the paintings. He was explaining them to her. A very cultural evening, he thought, when suddenly they came to a painting of Christ knocking at the door. And the little girl said, Daddy, what's that? What's that? Oh, he said, honey, that represents Jesus knocking at the door of man's heart. Why can't he get in, daddy? Oh, he said, I guess it's because there's some things behind the door. Like what, daddy? Well, maybe cocktails, theater tickets, money, cigarettes, bad habits. These things Lock the door, trying to placate the child, thinking that was a good answer. He started away, but she didn't come. When he turned back, she was staring at the picture, tears streaming down her face. He put his arm around her and said, honey, what's the matter? What's the matter? She said, daddy, I'm thinking about you. Has he knocked at your heart? Has he knocked at your heart? The father was struck by this. He said, well, yes, dear, I guess so. He knocked at everybody's heart. She said, but daddy, did he get in? Did he get in? Did he get in? Four weeks. Did he get in? The naked truth. Did he get in? An appeal to take you just as you are and wash away all your dirty sins. Did he get in? Did he get in? Did he get in? There's going to come a famine in the land. It's going to be too late to pray. Somebody will have fooled around for the last time. Somebody will have sinned away his day of grace. Somebody is going too far. 
tonight, will you let him in? I wonder if God has spoken to you tonight. Christ told me to ask you one more time. Plead with him, Charles, because somebody here is not going to have this opportunity again. This could be the last time for somebody. What else can I say? I feel before God I've delivered my soul. But that is not enough. If I walk out of this theater tonight, I will be thinking about those who sat in those seats and would not do right. I'll go to bed at night with you on my mind. I'll wake up in the night thinking about you. Why not now? Why not now? Why not come to Jesus now? The word's not going to change. It's never going to be easier than it is tonight. Why don't you stand and say, Lord, take me. I'm no good, but take me. I've been rebellious, Lord, but take me. I'm rotten to the core, Lord, but take me. For I take thee. I take thee. Why don't you give Jesus your heart tonight? Don't worry about the law and the Sabbath. Just make a surrender to Christ. And if you can do that sincerely, then you'll discover how easy his yoke is. And his burden is light. You see, it's a decision. It's not an emotional explosion. It's not losing control of your senses. It's not electricity running up and down your back. It's an intelligent decision. I'm so glad for Jesus tonight and what he's done, aren't you? If you're like me, you want a final blessing from this place, pronounced over this desk, honored by a merciful and loving God. If that's you, would you stand? You feel a need of mercy? Then stand. Feel a need of grace? Anybody here who didn't stand but you want prayer, you felt you should and you want prayer and courage to do God's will if you are, say amen. amen. And now we say the Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord cause his face to shine upon thee. The Lord watch between me and thee, between my house and thy house forever. In Jesus' holy name, may God bless you and go home with you is our prayer. God bless you, everyone.